Uh, good evening, everybody. I hope we have a large crowd out there listening to this. Uh, this is the Wilson Trust seminar that we advertised on Bob Duco's show. Uh, you're certainly all welcome, and I hope that you are all well and staying safe. And one of the ways that we're staying safe is by having this webinar as opposed to having it at my office or one of the other locations that we've uh, done the seminar in the past. The idea of this uh, is to give you an introductory course, so to speak, on wills and trusts and what they are and why you should have them. And so uh, there's myself here, uh, Tim Fund, my associate attorney who is monitoring the Q&A. So if you have any questions, uh, and you're, you might have to learn how to use uh, Zoom a little bit, if you have any questions about the material that we're covering, send them in and I'll try to incorporate the answers to your questions into the material as we cover it. But if I don't get to it, we will return to it at the end because we'll have a section or of our time uh, reserved for questions and answers. So anyway, having said that, let, let's get to work here. Um, here's some interesting statistics about wills. You know, 92% of people under 35 don't have a will. And a significant portions of adults uh, above 35 don't have wills and trusts. And that's a real tragedy because if something happens to you and within these days of COVID-19 and everything else that's happening around us, things can happen. Uh, you can get sick, you can die, you can, your affairs may not be in order when that happens. And the idea of the Wilson Trust Program is to help you solve that problem and to get things set up. So one, you avoid probate and the costs that are associated with that. Two, that the people who you want to have your assets and to own them, own them if, if you're not available to handle them. Three, to take care of you while you are alive, and we use certain techniques to do that, and we have certain a set of documents that we include in the package of documents that we do for everybody, uh, such as a durable power of attorney, a healthcare power of attorney, and HIPAA release forms and things of that. And we'll, we'll explain those a little later into this program. Um, I'm gonna try not to read these slides to you. I think that you know the people who are tuned in, I'm sure can, can read these all by themselves. So I'm gonna to try to give you more commentary than, than reading slides. So, uh, you know, it says 26% of women think that wills are too costly. Well, they're not too costly if they can help you avoid certain situations. Now, wills by themselves, and we're gonna to return to this subject in a little bit, mean probate because a will is nothing more than a nice fancy signed piece of paper unless you probate it. It, is, has, it has no authority. It doesn't convey any authority to the personal representative that you have uh, unless it's probated. So you have to go to court with a will. And how we set things up for you, for the most part, is so that you don't have to go to court, that you preserve your assets and there is no probate proceeding. Probate can cause three, five thousand dollars, depending on the amount of assets. It might be ten or fifteen thousand dollars. It can take nine months, maybe more, sometimes less, certainly. But it takes time to get all the documentation, to go through all the processes that are required by state statutes, to give notification to people, to resolve claims against your estate. All these can be avoided by proper estate planning. So when people say, "Why should I have an estate plan?" I think I just described why. You can save a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of stress for your friends or relatives or whoever you are who is concerned about you and about your getting your assets to the people that you want to have them and to protect those people as well. So uh, it says there that, and one of the stats there is 13% believe that a spouse or child automatically receives assets they have. That's not true. If you die without a will and without a trust, the state has a process called intestacy. Basically, the definition of intestacy is dying without a will. And it has a way of distributing property that's carved into statutes, and it applies, and it isn't necessarily what you would want. So if you want to avoid probate, and you want to avoid intestacy in particular, you got to have a will, and hopefully you'll have a trust. You'll also find that there's a lot of commentary on the internet as to whether you should have a trust. Um, trusts are not cheap. We try to keep the price down here and I stick assiduously to the prices that are quoted on Bob Duco's show. 
Um, but they are cost effective means of reducing expenses and they're very comprehensive documents and uh, they will do the job for you and keep you and your family protected uh, from intestacy or probate or whatever other situations might arise. So uh, let's move on from there. And again, if you have any questions about anything or any comments, just put them on the Q&A on Zoom. Okay, I often get this question, what is a will? Okay, generally a will is a written expression of your intent as to what you want done with your assets and who you want to protect, okay? It means nothing again, unless it's probated. And it also might serve some purposes of appointing a guardian if you have minor children. Um, a lot of people say, well, isn't my wife a guardian or isn't perhaps you're divorced? And then there's custody issues and guardianship issues. You should make your preferences known. You can do that with a will. You can also do that in the state of Michigan through uh, the durable power of attorney and healthcare power of attorney to nominate somebody. Again, a nomination is a indication to the court that's who you want. The court's charged with determining what's in the best interest of your children, and they may not accept your nomination. But most often, unless there's some kind of unusual situation, they do. But if you haven't nominated anybody, the issue is wide open. They can nominate anybody, or anybody can come in and say, I want to be their guardian. So that, that uncle who you know, says, oh, these kids might have a lot of money uh, from life insurance or something like that. I'd like to be their guardian so they might have access to some of that money. Again, a trust will avoid that problem if you use that technique. Okay, so guardianships are important. Wills are a document that has to be signed in a particular manner. Under Michigan state law, it has to be signed in the presence of two people, and it's best to have them unrelated so there's no question about their credibility. And if it's not signed in front of two people, it's not valid. So some people say, well, why don't I just write out on a piece of paper and sign my name and isn't that a valid will? In some cases it can be. That a handwritten will is called a holographic will. And it isn't necessarily what you need or want, um, but, and they're usually contested. And many of them are found to be invalid because they haven't been done properly. So unless you fancy yourself as an attorney who can figure out the statutes as to how a holographic will works or, and, or, or the case law, we don't recommend that you try to use a holographic will or to save money with that. And another question is, well, how about these legal Zoom documents or Rocket Lawyer or whatever else you find online? Well, it only costs a couple hundred bucks to do that. And that, that could be a big mistake too because they aren't necessarily complete. They aren't necessarily thoroughly compliant with Michigan law. And, you know, um, you know, there's an old expression, the, the person that represents themselves in legal matters has a fool for a client. Okay, you also have an uneducated attorney working for you who doesn't know anything if you're trying to represent yourself. So again, we recommend whether you use my office or not, if you're going to get your wills and trust done, use an attorney who is experienced in drafting these documents. It's very important that they be done properly. And of course, we believe that we do them properly and would love to be able to represent you. And so what we do with regard to this, and I'm gonna put a little plug for my sponsor in here right now. Um, we have a, a, what we call a no obligation consultation. So if you wanna talk about your situation and not be exposed to expending any money, uh, you can come in and talk to us. We'll spend an hour, hour and a half, whatever it takes to answer your questions. And if you decide to go ahead with us, fine. And if you do not, we understand. Uh, it's a no obligation thing. You're not financially exposed until you decide to retain us. So anyway, back, back to the details of what a will is. Assuming that it's probated, a will appoints what we call a personal representative. Now, everybody's kind of used to seeing things on TV about the executor, okay? Well, since the probate code was changed in Michigan uh, to what we call EPIC, and EPIC stands for Estates and Protected Individuals Code, uh, until that was changed, there was such thing in the probate code as an executor. 
But when the EPIC was passed, they just tried to make everything gender neutral and so forth. And so now the person that you appoint is known as a personal representative. There are no new executors in Michigan. There are personal representatives. And that person's job is to comply with the law and get your estate uh, inventoried and to follow the will if it, there are any assets to which the will attaches to and to get them distributed. Now, you should know that what we do here is we create typically, although sometimes a, just a will is appropriate, uh, and it's a standalone th type of thing because people have taken care of their assets in another fashion than by using a trust, uh, which is not always the best thing to do. But again, we can discuss your situation when you come in. But in any event, that the, the personal representative has to follow the rules of EPIC and distribute the property. And the will that we do is what we call a pour over will. And a pour over will is one that which takes the assets that go through probate and put them into your trust so the trustee manages it. So everything with your estate with regard to the property, once the estate is probated and the probate estate is closed, is handled by the person that you designate as your trustee. So let's look at the next slide here. <clears throat> okay, what's a trust? Okay, it's another good question. A trust is a very sophisticated three-party contract. And it's taken on a special legal meaning, a certain respect that the courts give it. And in the trust that we create, it creates a legal entity. But a revocable trust is, interestingly, is ignored by the Internal Revenue Service until such time that it becomes irrevocable. When it becomes irrevocable, it's usually on the death of one of the spouses that create it, but it can be made to become irrevocable under other circumstances as well. But until that happens, you do not need to file a special tax return. Any tax issues that arise inside the assets that are owned by that trust are reported on your 1040, your regular tax return, as if the trust didn't exist. You don't need a tax ID for it or anything like that. Now, Interestingly, you wear a lot of hats if you create a revocable trust. You're what we call the grantor or settlor. That's the language that's most commonly used. Well, there is a new term that's floated around and I, we don't use it here because I, I just find it to be a little bit funky and it's called the trust maker. So if you're the trust maker, the grantor or the settlor, you're all the same person and you're the person that's creating the trust. You're contracting with the trustee. Okay, in a revocable living trust, you wear the hat of the grantor settlor and you're also your own trustees. So assuming it's between a husband and a wife, if one of those persons dies, the survivor is the remaining trustee. So it's a self-trustee trust. And who are the beneficiaries? That's the third party in this. The contract is between the grantor and settlor and the trustee for the benefit of the beneficiaries. Well, if you're, if you're alive, the way these things are typically run and stru structured, you have, are the beneficiaries as well. So you wear three hats, grantor, settlers, trust makers, trustees, and beneficiaries. Okay, now a trust doesn't exist unless it attaches to something. So you have to transfer assets into a trust. We do that in a variety of ways. Uh, typically, we just say you put $10 into a trust. You can create a trust for that account. You can make the trust the beneficiary of a life insurance policy. You can make the trust the owner of real estate, or you can make the trust what we call the future owner or remainder man of uh, 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 a deed that creates a life estate in your real estate holds onto it for yourself and then automatically transfers it to the trust. By the way, that kind of deed <clears throat> is a ladybird deed and it's one of the main devices that we use to avoid probate. Um, because what you do is you transfer your real estate to yourself for life, retaining the right to sell, refinance, or convey the property just like you did if you didn't enter into a ladybird deed. When the first person dies, it still belongs on the life estate to the survivor. And when the survivor dies, it goes to the trust 
and a property can be held for the benefit of the beneficiaries or surviving beneficiaries. Some people want their relatives to live in their, in their, you know, their home, their family home, or provide for that capability. Or some people say, well, we're done with it, sell it and divide the proceeds the way we tell you we want to divide it amongst our beneficiaries. So that's how we do those things. We fund things with uh, creating contingent interests in bank accounts, insurance, and so forth. One thing we typically don't do, however, and this question comes up a lot, is we don't necessarily assign the proceeds of qualified plans, such as 401ks, IRAs, Roth IRAs, 457 contracts, 403Bs, and the like, because they, if they're paid, made payable to a trust as opposed to a person, they get less advantageous tax treatment than they would if you paid them directly to the trust. It, there's nothing wrong with paying it to the trust, but what happens is that the tax impacts are immediate. Whatever tax is due on whatever income tax was deferred is due upon your death or six months later. And I, uh, a state tax return has to be filed and if there's any tax due, then it's income tax now. It's not a state and gift tax. The, uh, that tax has to be paid by the beneficiaries. And that's unfortunate because if you arrange things in the proper way, although that's recently been changed somewhat by what we call the SECURE Act, um, that forces a faster payout of those assets and consequently a faster tax, it still stretches it out over a period of time in certain instances that provided by the SECURE Act. And that can reduce the overall tax impact of having uh, a qualified plan payable to a trust. So again, if there's any questions about this stuff, we're covering some fairly detailed and sophisticated things, okay? So here's a little chart that shows the differences between a, a trust and a will. And by the way, if anybody wants these slides to be sent to them, if they'll send us uh, an email afterwards, or perhaps just let us know on the Q&A, we have your email addresses and so forth that you registered with with WMUC, and we can send you these things if you like, just as a refresher. So if you wanna just listen and not take notes, that's okay too, because there's a means of you know, getting these things. You don't have to write them all down now. And that's really not the intent of this webinar. The idea is for you to get an idea of how, one, how complex this is, but two, that there are solutions to these problems. So I'm not gonna belabor this chart, but if you do look at it, you'll see that it has different impacts the trusts and a will have different impacts. So there are different types of trusts as well. And you know, if, if you were the CPAs and financial planners, I would probably give you a list of about a hundred different types of trusts there are. But what I'm gonna do is try to give you some background on just the general types of trusts that we're talking about. And I've already mentioned this, the revocable trust. You can sign a trust, you can amend it anytime you want, it avoids probate, there's no public record required, it's private. Under EPIC, trusts are treated very privately and you don't have to disclose them to anybody. Um, in fact, it's one of the uh, documents that we do for our clients is called a certificate of trust and an affidavit of trust. And those documents include the information that a administrator of a 401k would need or that a bank would need to change the uh, designations of the beneficiaries on a bank account, or that an insurance company would need for that same purpose, for changing the beneficiaries of insurance policies. So you never really have to give that entire trust to anybody unless somehow it ends up in litigation. It, while we do these things with the goal of keeping you out of court entirely, it's possible that you know, you could end up in court. And candidly, the more money that's involved in a state or trust, the more likelihood there's gonna be litigation. But again, litigation might be one-tenth or 1% of all the trusts that are ever created. And uh, it's most likely that you won't have any litigation. And if, you're, if your beneficiaries are getting along and they're treated fairly in their mind, that's fine. Oh, well, by the way, some people come into the office and they say, you know, I don't want to give anything to so-and-so. They've been the bane of my existence for whatever reasons, and I want to disinherit them. 
You can do that in a trust, but if you're going to do it through a will, and we also put this into wills, under Michigan law, you must specifically state that you're disinheriting somebody in order for that disinheritance to be ineffective, to be effective, I'm sorry. And um, it's also important that you repeat that in the trust as well. So sometimes people want to do that. Um, families have all sorts of different kinds of problems. Typically, where in my practice where that has come up is when um, uh, parents have become disaffected of their children or vice versa. Uh, sometimes a child has gotten into drugs and things like that, unfortunately, and has sapped a lot of resources from their parents. And uh, they, they need to watch out for themselves and take care of themselves. And so they set up their affairs in such a way that uh, that child is disinherited, having given them all that they can up to that point. Um, other, other ways of doing things are to set up a separate trust for them. Uh, and that's not an impossibility either. That's usually an irrevocable trust so that nobody can get the assets if they're not being used for, to help assist that person with perhaps medical care and rehab and education and things of that nature. So, but the typical trust that we set up is a joint trust. It's a revocable trust between a husband and a wife. And as it says there, it can always be changed around. And I got a question coming in here. Uh, we typically do not, to answer that question, we typically do not act as personal representatives. In certain situations, we will act as, uh, as trustees. Uh, right now, the best thing to do is to find, we, we have, there are independent companies and trust companies that will act as personal representatives. And that way we don't have a conflict of interest between anybody. And that's why we try not to act as personal representatives. Uh, some law firms have a different attitude about that, to be very honest with you. They, they relish, you know, acting in that capacity. It isn't that we don't do it. We just don't do it frequently. And um, the problem is when attorneys act as personal representatives, it gets very expensive. And uh, hopefully you can find uh, somebody who can act as your personal representative other than an attorney because you'll save your estate a lot of money. Again, any questions, we'll take it. Now, I've already mentioned irrevocable trust. And as it says there, underlined, it cannot be terminated or changed once created. Usually, we let uh, the beneficiaries elect a new trustee if there's a problem, but you can't change the dispositive provisions of it. And if you have enough uh, assets in your estate to have tax considerations attached to your affairs, sometimes an irrevocable trust is used as a means of pulling value out of a trust or out of your estate rather so that your estate doesn't get larger and you keep the tax burden down. Uh, in those instances you cannot be the trustee. Okay, you cannot be a beneficiary of an irre irrevocable trust that's set up for tax purposes. We do set up irrevocable trusts for Medicaid uh, purposes uh, to uh, set up trust. Uh, you could set up a trust for a child who is going to need government assistance or is uh, in need of government assistance now. Sometimes in a uh, replicable trust, uh, a, uh, a couple or a guardian or a single adult who's responsible for a child will set up a what we call a standby supplemental needs trust. And that's set up so that it's just the distributions to that individual are discretionary and as long as that individual cannot force the payment of monies out of the trust in any way, shape, or form, then that's the assets in the trust are not included for calculation of their assets for purposes of whether or not they can get Medicaid and uh, that kind of assistance from the government. Okay, so the revocable trust is, has a certain uses here and there. Uh, uh, we do them for tax planning purposes, and we do them for Medicaid purposes, and we just do them for general planning purposes too, if the situation warrants it. Everybody's situation is unique. I, I tell my clients, and you know, prospectively you are clients, but there's a lot of similarities in everybody's estate plans, but there's also many differences because we all have different families. We all have different family issues. 
We all have different domestic relationships within those families and different issues and problems and health issues and whatever else can has to be addressed in these documents. So while we have general types of documents, they're typically need custom drafting. If we end up uh, including a special needs trust in a revocable trust, we do charge more for that, but it sometimes makes great sense to do that. Now let's talk a little bit about taxes. Right now, uh, starting in, in the beginning of uh, 2018, and going through 2025, there is a what we call the unified credit that uh, offsets a taxable estate of $11.6 million. I don't know about you, but I'm not too worried about that. Uh, perhaps some of the, you do have that kind of situation. Uh, very few clients get up there. It's really the 1% of the 1% right now that have to be worried about estate taxes. But in 2025, that law sunsets, and it might go back to $5.6 million. And that's not so far-fetched, given inflation of assets, business interests, and things of that nature. So these are things that have to be addressed, and you have to deal with things prospectively for the current laws and what might happen after 2025. Nobody really knows. If I think it was in 2012 that there was no estate and gift tax. Congress and their infinite wisdom decided that they were not going to have passed the laws and some very wealthy families in this country were able to uh, skirt the or escape from estate taxes and paid no estate taxes at all on huge amounts of money. Like we're talking millions and billions. Let me take a look at another question here. Okay, this is a, what about an inheritance trust keeping assets just for family members? Well, a trust can be set up that way. Um, certainly, uh, you run into what we call the rule against perpetuities, which goes back several hundred years. And uh, it, it's rather complex. We deal with it simply within the documents that we have, but essentially, the idea is to keep a trust from lasting forever. In other words, that rule against it being perpetual. And so usually the rule is a trust must be terminated and the assets distributed within 21 years of a life and being. So if you have a, a young child that's just born and you make the rule against perpetuities 21 years from that person's life, the end of that person's life, then you know it could be extended out quite a long time. But they, a trust cannot be perpetual, not this type of trust anyway. So uh, we're not talking about a corporate trust, which is a totally different animal. But uh, these types of trusts that are used in estate planning are subject to the rule against perpetuities. And so you can set things up just for your heirs. So, so there's a couple in today. Um, they're in their 50s and they're in, well, one's 51, the other's in, her, in uh, their 40s are concerned about setting things up for their children who are adults. Um, they're in their late 20s. And um, they said, what can we do? Well, we can set up a trust just for them. And if, if their children aren't alive at the time that uh, they are both deceased, then it, the child share, the deceased child share will go to their descendants. In other words, the grandchildren, if that's how they prefer to set it up. These things in the United States, you can contract to do anything that's legal. A trust is a contract. Therefore, <clears throat> if your purposes are not illegal and it's not too convoluted to reduce to unambiguous writing, which is our job, you can set up a trust to do virtually anything. So I hope I'm answering your question. Let me see if we got another one here. Yeah, can you put a business into a personal trust? Uh, yes, you can. And that's sometimes part of a succession plan for businesses. Uh, if you have an LLC, you can assign the uh, membership interest of the LLC to a trust. Uh, same thing for a sub S corporation. There are certain qualifications to do that in order to be a qualified sub S uh, corporation trust. Uh, but we can usually help with that as well. So, and if it's just a regular C-Corp, you can assign your stock interests 
uh, either on a contingent basis or make the trust a contingent beneficiary of your stock. It, so it can be an immediate transfer, it can be a transfer upon your death. Again, it's a very flexible situation. I would need more to know more about the specific questions, uh, excuse me, the specific circumstances that generated your question uh, in order to answer it more fully. Okay, so uh, assets put in a tax and in, into an irrevocable trust, by the way, are tax to beneficiaries, not to you. Okay, so. Uh, most recently, the main reason I do irrevocable trust because we don't have the tax planning uh, need right now is to take care of people on Medicaid or special needs trusts just in general so that uh, assets are put away permanently for that, the individual who has various challenges. And you can fund those trusts with an insurance policy. So even if you don't have a lot of money and you're worried about your children, child who has a problem, you can fund it with life insurance and that person's gonna be protected for the rest of their life, assuming you put it all together. Again, we've been talking about special needs trusts, okay? And special needs trusts will provide, you know, avoid the necessity of a spend down requirements if you do them properly. They cannot be done willy nilly and they have to be done according to the law and certain special needs trusts have to be done in accordance with recent Supreme Court rulings, which have um, uh, verified uh, in, in their existence and uh, made them uh, capable of being enforced and avoiding the Medicare spend on issues that would otherwise be encountered. So again, that's usually something that we talk about in detail when people come in who have the need to talk about these issues and to address them going forward. Okay, now there's a third party SNT. This is where We've been, that's a special needs trust again. Another name for special needs trust, by the way, can be supplemental needs trust. That's commonly used as well. And um, the, uh, the idea of this is that you have separate monies put aside for somebody with Medicaid issues, and uh, that's an irrevocable trust typically, okay? Okay, and now, now oops. Uh, there we go. We, they're solely for the benefit trust. And I mentioned that you have to comply with certain Supreme Court rulings. This is the court ruling, uh, <clears throat> more or less uh, condoned the use of solely for the benefit trusts. And there are trusts set up by the individual. Uh, I have a client who's asked me to do one of these and she expects her daughter to be, um, come the beneficiary in, in another sense of a judgment against a company and she expects to get a lot of money. On the other hand, this person has various challenges. And so what we're doing is we're setting it up so that the monies that she derives from this lawsuit uh, will be put away for her in a solely for the benefit of situation so that the money's there while she needs it. And uh, later on, when the, some monies might have to be paid to Medicaid, but the balance can be sent on to her beneficiaries. So that's when you'll, you'll see the nomenclature SBO trusts or solely for the benefit of trusts uh, if you get into researching this or looking this up online. Now, there's a what we call a testamentary trust. And uh, Bill Davidson, the owner of the um, Pistons when he died, is a multi-billionaire, uh, had a testamentary trust. His whole situation went through probate. Um, there was a trust set up and uh, there were people still administering it. Uh, and it, the trust is set up in a will. It's actually contained in the will. And once the will is probated and the state is closed, that trust is funded and the personal reps and might become the trustees or you can have separate trustees as well. And that is how that is set up. But if you ever hear of a testamentary trust, it's one that does not avoid probate. And, uh, as it says here, generally created for young children with relatives with disabilities or others who have large sums of money and who you know, don't care about the cost of probate, they want it set up in one instrument. And then there's other tax issues that uh, emanate from the use of testamentary trusts as well. So, okay, now we're, now we're talking about lifetime issues, okay? 
many of you may not have heard of what a, a durable power of attorney. A durable power of attorney is a document that's uh, drafted in accordance with state law, whereby you appoint somebody as your agent. We call them, in this instance, the attorney in fact, to have the powers to look over your finances. And in many respects, um, that avoids the need to go to court to get somebody appointed as the conservator or guardian for somebody who has become legally or physically disabled. Again, going to court uh, and getting guardianships and stuff like that can cost thousands of dollars. Uh, a durable powers of attorney is included in the documents that we do for $1,800 for a couple and $1,400 for a single individual. Uh, that person has the ability to handle your finances and so forth. You got to be careful with these documents, however, because there's two ways of drafting them. There's a, you can draft them so that they're automatically effective upon signature, in which case your attorney, in fact, has your power of agency right then and there. And if you don't choose the right person, uh, sometimes, uh, and sometimes people don't, uh, that person might go empty out your bank account or something like that. So you have to choose wisely. Typically, between a husband and wife, that's not a problem, um, although it can become one later on. These documents can all be changed. You can, all, you can terminate that durable power of attorney instantaneously with a notice delivered to somebody. So, and if you do that, you should also let your banks and insurance companies, and everybody else know that you're terminating that power of attorney. But um, until they allow durable powers of attorney, if you became disabled, the only way that you could take care of your spouse in one instance or somebody else like a child would be to go to court and to get uh, a durable power of attorney, uh, excuse me, a guardianship uh, or a conservatorship for that person or over that person. So a guardianship deals with the legal, the person's legal rights, their being, and a conservatorship deals with their assets. So a durable power of attorney kind of crosses those lines and covers all of them. But uh, again, there are instances where you may have to go to court that is very limited if you have a durable power of attorney. Now, I want to warn everybody out there who has an adult child who's not married. So you have children over 18 and they are not married and have not, or if they are married and don't have these documents, they should be giving you or their spouse, perhaps, a durable power of attorney because this is what can happen. Um, Let's say you have somebody at school uh, and your son or daughter is injured and you rush up to the ho university hospital and you say, I'm so-and-so's parent and I want to do the following. The first question that the medical people will ask you is, oh, you have a health care power of attorney for them? You have a durable power of attorney for them? And if you don't, it's usually too late to get one because that person might be comatose or unable to participate in their medical decisions or something like that. So it's very, very important that you consider getting these from your children. I have three adult children who are on their young side. They're tw 21, soon to be 22, and 26. I and my wife have durable powers of attorney from them, appointing us as both their durable power of attorneys and healthcare power of attorneys, so that if something happens to them, we can take care of them, and we don't have to try to run to court to get an emergency guardianship ruling so that I can participate in their medical care or something of that nature. Very important for all of you. Okay, so we, we talked about why you might need a durable power of attorney. Uh, if they become incapacitated, you can take care of their financial affairs. You can pay their bills. You can pay their mortgage. You don't have a foreclosure. Those type of things. Uh, you can deal with the insurance companies. You can get their benefits paid. Again, we can send these slides out to you, but understand that a durable power of attorney makes sure in most instances that you do not need to go to court to get yourself appointed as a guardian or conservator, okay? And also will appoint a guardian if you have uh, minor children. Nominate, not appoint, but nominate them. So the next thing that we do uh, for our clients is to provide a healthcare power of attorney or instead of calling them a healthcare attorney, in fact, we call them a patient advocate. And the patient advocate's job is to assist your medical uh, people in the event you're not able to participate and effectively contribute to your healthcare. 
Now, many of you may have heard of a living will. A living will is more of a hard directive to people as to what they can or cannot do. A healthcare power attorney is not that kind of directive. And unfortunately, some attorneys in our area call healthcare powers of attorneys living wills. Unfortunately, there's no statute in the state of Michigan that supports living wills. So that can be a real problem. You, know, you think you're getting a living will, you have a healthcare power of attorney, and, and the difference is maybe a nuance. In a healthcare power of attorney, it, you, you're telling your patient advocate what you want. In a living will, you're directing not only that person, but the doctors as to what you want. And in Michigan, they didn't pass that. They passed a statute that allows the, the doctors to practice medicine as they see fit. So it's a combination of your patient advocate and the doctor who's going to make this decision as to what's going to happen. Now, a lady came in today. She said, under no circumstances am I going to be hooked up to equipment. I don't want my life prolonged artificially by mechanical means and so forth. In other words, that's kind of scary um, in light of the fact that we have COVID-19. And it's quite possible that that person might end up on a ventilator. Her healthcare power of attorney says, I don't want to be hooked up to a ventilator. Well, if the doctors see, that's the difference between a living will and a healthcare power of attorney. If a doctor says, no, we can, re we can restore this person's health by putting him or her on a ventilator, that's what's going to happen. They're, they're not going to have any liability for not complying with the healthcare power of attorney. But you can express your wishes. It's an excellent idea. Many of you, if you've, if you've been to a hospital recently, they pull out the statutory form and they have you fill one of these out every time you go to the hospital. It's a good idea to have one of these as a standby document because, um, well, as my law school professors used to say, what if your client walked out of your office and got hit by a bus. Well, around here, they you know pick you up off the pavement, put you in an ambulance, and take you up to Beaumont Hospital at 13 in Woodward. I'm just at 11 in Woodward. And um, at that point in time, you're probably in no condition to sign a statutory health care power attorney. So it's a good idea to have one in place, and that's what we do here for you. We make sure that that gap in your documentation and what you need to take care of yourself doesn't exist. Okay, it is again, these are circumstances that why you need a healthcare power of attorney. And the same thing goes for a healthcare power of attorney as it does for a durable power of attorney for children over 18, if they're not married and have not, if they are married, if they haven't given somebody else a durable or healthcare power of attorney. Very important. We do charge for this, but if you're doing your estate planning with us, <clears throat> we reduce the price and uh, we do sets of these documents, the healthcare power of attorney, HIPAA release, and the durable power of attorney for your children, your adult children, uh, at a reduced price. So we can talk about that when you come in. Okay. Um, I think we all... Uh, remember Terry Scheibel. She uh, was injured and was on life support for years while her husband and her family fought over whether or not she could be taken off uh, artificial support equipment. <clears throat> Finally, he prevailed and she was taken off the equipment and she died soon thereafter. And um, it was determined by autopsy that she had been brain dead since the incident that caused her to be in a vegetative state and that the hundreds of thousands of dollars that her her husband and her family spent fighting this out was for naught and that's a terrible situation that can all be avoided with healthcare powers of attorney so that's one major thing uh, another thing is in a healthcare power of attorney you can also appoint uh, a guardian we do that as well and um, so that that's one of the, the re few reasons that uh, you need a healthcare power of attorney, particularly in the state of Michigan. Okay, uh, as I said earlier, uh, and as we advertise on Bob Duco's show uh, every weekday, 
we do uh, a complete estate plan uh, for individuals for $1,400 and $1,800 for a couple. Now, mind you, that does not include special needs planning. It doesn't include separate rep irrevocable trusts, and it doesn't include those separate durable powers of attorney. But we don't charge huge amounts of money. You, if you price these things out with other attorneys, you'll find you'll probably be quoted between $2,500 and $5,000 for these documents. Uh, we try to make our services accessible. On the other hand, these are not discounted. You might be getting a discounted price, but these are not discounted documents. They are very comprehensive documents and are intended to be as complete and thorough a solution for you as you would get if you spent, and maybe even more so than if you spent huge dollars more uh, with other offices. So. Okay, so this is typically what's included. Uh, all these documents here, if it's, uh, if it's one of our standard packages, we end up you know, with 21, 22 documents, uh, depending on you know, what your needs are. Uh, if there are assignments of stock interests and other things that are separate, it, it might be more than this, and, but it's not, we don't charge hundreds of dollars for an assignment. We, it all depends on what you want done. Uh, might be a few hundred dollars more to assign uh, real estate interests of a different nature if you own something other than your residence. Uh, we typically recommend, by the way, if you're owning more than one parcel of investment property that you do one of the following. You do them in separate limited liability companies or you have at least one limited liability company that owns them. You assign the interest in that limited liability company to the trust and everything's in the trust that way. And you, know, and you can or you can sell the LLCs if they're in separate LLCs as opposed to the real estate and that sometimes has tax advantages to it as well. So there's tax planning things that don't jump off the pages of what we've been talking about today and we can talk about those things when you come in if it's apropos. Okay at our firm here we do uh, all these things here in addition to those things we've talked about. There's in Michigan, there's a separate asset protection trust. This is used by professionals to protect their property from malpractice suits and things of that nature. A very good idea. Gun trusts are for uh, firearms and certain classified uh, weapons that should be in a trust for transfer purposes so that you don't run afoul of various federal statutes. And we do those as well. Okay. If you have any questions, please uh, send them to Tim and he will give them to me and I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability. Okay, how do you guarantee to leave a property to a certain family member? Well, you can create a ladybird deed that runs just to that person, or you can put it into a trust and leave it to that person. And the reason that we would recommend a trust is what if that person predeceases you and you can't affect your interests? So a trust would have a fallback position in it. Candidly, you could do that in a deed as well, but if you're doing a, a will and a trust anyway, we can accommodate it. So there's a variety of ways of accommodating that desire to have a property go to a specific individual. So hopefully I answered your question on that one. Yeah, any other questions, I'd be glad to hear from you. Okay, um, if you create a will and a trust now, uh, typically when you buy a residence, and the question was sort of planning on buying a residence in the next six months, typically that's bought either by the individual or uh, by the individual and that individual spouse, in which case it would be husband and wife. Okay, if it's husband and wife, that's typically what the title companies will prefer that you do. At that point in time, you can strike a ladybird deed. You're talking anywhere, depending on whether it's one parcel or not. But if it's just one parcel, typically that's going to cost $250, $300 to get that into your trust or directed to your trust at a later date. So that can be accommodated as well. But if you don't have estate planning documents now, don't use that two, $300 as an excuse to not get this done now, okay? 
Um, we are holding our prices where they are right now, but understand that um, you know prices do go up eventually. Legal services have are, are going up, and interestingly, I haven't raised my rates uh, uh, because of COVID and whatever. But some people are raising their rates. Uh, it's not my intention to do that, but you know. Uh, the market might dictate that that is appropriate at some point in time. But uh, aside from cost, all the advantages of having these documents done for yourself, including basically, in a very basic sense, the peace of mind that says that you've taken care of your affairs and what goes along with that is probably worth the fact that you might incur some costs later on. Um, I had a question earlier today about what we charge for amendments. Typically, amendments are very minor and they're a few hundred dollars. And rather than run uh, an amendment and have amendment number one and perhaps amendment number two and three later on, what I prefer to do here is just restate the entire trust with a new language in it. And that takes care of any questions as to whether or not that amendment was intended, whether it's valid, whether it's enforceable, and so forth. You redo your trust, assuming it's a replicable one and can be amended then there's no problem with that. And it's much better. I don't charge more for reprinting the whole trust. Uh, it's just paper. And so uh, you would pay for the services of drafting the new language that's gonna be in your trust. And then we'd have to have a trust signed and notarized just like we would, whether it's an amendment or a new trust anyway. So it's not typically a very expensive proceeding. Let me take a look at this next question here. <clears throat> okay, would a um, single father of a seven-year-old need uh, if uh, that child is on Social Security because his mother passed? Okay, if you're going to accumulate money and take care of things uh, for your child uh, uh, at, at, without another parent, you might want to create a trust just for that individual's benefit anyway. You, there's no guarantee that you're going to be alive for that child. And so you want to provide the appointment of a guardian. You want to provide assets because Social Security is not going to cover the education of that person. Um, unfortunately, statistics are that the cost of raising a person in a modest situation from birth through high school in the United States today is approximately $300,000. That doesn't even include college. So if you want to include resources for education, you need to fund a trust with a life insurance policy that goes well beyond Social Security. So uh, yeah, you need a trust. And uh, it goes got nothing to do really with the fact that that child is receiving Social Security because one of the parents died. Anything else? I got more coming. So as we get them, we'll try to answer them for you. Okay, if a person already has a will and trust, what would you, what would cause you to have to go to probate? <clears throat> well, if you have a will and you haven't funded your trust properly, in order for that will to do anything for you, you will have to go to probate. As I said earlier, a will is a meaningless piece of paper unless it's probated. You have to go to probate in order to enforce the provisions of that will. Otherwise, you are intestate with regard to assets that aren't in the trust. So this relates back to funding and the necessity of dotting I's and crossing T's when it comes to funding a trust. <clears throat> okay, uh, what is a ladybird trust? I've never heard of a ladybird trust. I've heard of a ladybird deed and um, some of you out there are old enough to remember Lyndon and Lady Bird Johnson. Um, Lyndon was just a school teacher, but he married very well when he married Lady Bird because her family was a family of then multimillionaires. Perhaps they would be even more wealthy uh, and be the billionaire category. But Lyndon was a simple school teacher, and so he was able to finance his political aspirations and so forth. And as we know, he became president. 
uh, after Kennedy was shot, and then he was re he was elected to one term after that, and refused to run for another, primarily because of the uh, situation in the country, uh, which was uh, being disrupted by protesters over uh, civil rights legislation and uh, the war in Vietnam. I guess not dissimilar to what we have going on today with the war against COVID and and civil rights uh, issues as well. Um, but in any event, Lady Bird Johnson's attorneys would, uh, what they did was they had her deed her real estate and her other assets to herself for life and then to her trust. So as soon as she died, there was no probate estate. Everything was in the trust by means of the deed. And that's probably what you're referring to by Lady Bird Trust. There's Lady Bird deeds into a trust, but candidly, I've never heard of a Lady Bird Trust. So I hope that answers your question. But I, I, we will look up Lady Bird Trust and see if there is such an animal. I don't think there is one. Okay, next one. Explained by an irrevocable living trust cannot be changed or terminated. Well, I wanna make sure that you understand that in most instances we do a revocable one, which can be amended, terminated, changed, whatever you want. An irrevocable one is made that way to complete court with certain statutes and the needs of the beneficiaries so that somebody can come along and let's say you want to set up a trust, a third party special needs trust for um, a child with various challenges, cerebral palsy, other deficiencies, uh, other health issues, uh, hemophilia, uh, leukemia, you name it, okay? And you want to make sure that that trust is there you then provide in the trust that it is irrevocable, that nobody can take that away from that person. And that's why an irrevocable trust cannot be changed or amended, okay? I mean, if you need to do uh, other things, you can do another trust, but there's reasons why an irrevocable trust is made that way. And the actual, the, the various number of reasons would go beyond the scope of this webinar, but Again, if you'd like to come in, I'd be glad to talk to you about it. Okay, here's the next one. Can you amend a revocable trust? By definition, you can amend a revocable trust, absolutely. So sometimes people say, okay, I wanna uh, have my house go to uh, my older daughter. She's lived there all her life. She's not married and I'd like her to live there and give her the house. Well, what if she predeceases you by some hap set, you know, set of circumstances? What happens to that house then? Well, you might provide that it goes as to be sold or that's to be given, uh, the use of it's to be given to somebody else for life uh, and that the trustee will pay the insurance and the taxes on it until that person's deceased, at which time the property would be sold and the proceeds would be distributed amongst other beneficiaries. So absolutely, you can amend a revocable trust or again, a multitude of reasons for doing that. Uh, uh, again, this alludes to the fact that everybody's circumstances are different. At the end of the day, you know, there's custom issues that need to be addressed in estate plans. Anything else? Okay, we're here. You can call us at uh, during regular business hours at 248-546-2800. You can reach me on email. Uh, you can reach us through the WMUZ website if you prefer. Uh, we do estate planning. We do a lot of business transactions and real estate transactions. We have a section of our firm that handles bankruptcy. Uh, we politely call that insolvency work. Uh, we do chapter sevens and 13s for individuals and sometimes 11s. And we do chapter 11s and chapter sevens for businesses. Uh, if COVID has caused your business to be uh, in jeopardy, uh, talk to us because the bankruptcy laws may allow you to continue to exist. Uh, we also do chapter 12s. For, these are primarily for farming partnerships. So again, if you've had trouble with that type of issue and you know the, the economy has been disruptive to your firm and or your company and your, your farming, uh, we can assist you with that. So we're a multifaceted firm. We've recently added the ability to handle divorce and domestic relations issues. We would welcome anybody. Again, 
Uh, anybody who comes in is on a no obligation appointment. Uh, let me explain what that means. If you again, if you come in, you have a meeting with us, and you retain us, great. Uh, we would include the time of that meeting in whatever we bill you for. If you decide that you don't want to work with our firm for any reason, you get up and you leave, and you don't get a bill. So again, we would welcome meeting you and discussing things with you. We are following social distancing rules here. We spray down our tables and pens and chairs and things like that with antiseptics. And we wear masks and gloves uh, to make sure that you're safe and that we're safe. And even though it, it looks kind of different than in these days, uh, we're, we're doing well with that and people seem to be comfortable with it. And we hope you'll take advantage of the fact that we're open. Or we can set up uh, Zoom meetings like this with all of you as individuals, if you prefer. Or uh, there's many other ways of doing this. Uh, there's uh, Apple FaceTime and there's Microsoft Teams. Uh, whatever you're comfortable with, you let us know and we can do it. And we would welcome all of you to uh, make further inquiry of us at Goodman Associates. And if there are no more questions at this time, I will uh, end this, our webinar for today and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you in the future and hearing from you. Okay, well, thank you again. And uh, I hope this was informative to you and that it helps answer some questions and uh, that we can hopefully we'll, we'll be able to help you with your estate planning and other legal needs in the future. Thank you very much.